Uh, next up, we have Julian uh, Sterling, uh, and he's going to talk about transitioning an open hardware project to traditional met or to distributed medical device production, which sounds interesting. Distributed production is always an interesting topic. All right, Julian, uh, if you're ready. Cool. Can you hear away. me? Yep, you're good to go. Okay, let's try and get this screen share working. Select. Okay, hopefully that works. So, right. So, uh, yeah, my talks on transitioning. Um, okay, sorry. My talks on transitioning an open uh, hardware project to a distributed uh, medical device production, and I'm mostly going to talk about um, mostly going to talk about the actual. Uh, the design and how you actually move it towards sort of a medical design. So I'm going to talk a little bit about our project, which is the Open Flexor project, talk about specific challenges of medical device design, and then next step as we move towards distributed manufacturing. So the Open Flexor project, um, unlike most of the sort of open source medical uh, projects, it's pre-COVID-19, so it's a, it's a 3D printed microscope. And so 3D printing, it allows you to make uh, completely unique structures. Uh, and it's designed uh, so it's optimized for printing in plastic. It's not just a cheap imitation of a, uh, a metal microscope. And it's set up so anyone can reproduce the design. And so very quickly, why does it look like that? So you have to think about what a microscope is. People always think about the optics. They think there's a light source, there's some lenses. But the hardest part of building a microscope is you need to move the sample around to see what you want. You need to move the sample up and down to get it into focus. And if you don't do that well, there's all sorts of things you can attach to a phone that will just about make an image. Somebody will show you a beautiful image because smartphones have such great cameras. You can put a lens in front of them. They don't tell you about the swearing, the hours of poking it, shouting at it, getting annoyed before you eventually get an image. And that's never going to work in a clinic. So a traditional microscope uses uh, things like dovetails, highly machined surfaces to get the very precise motion. Whereas when we're 3D printing, making a dovetail doesn't work well, but we can build flexures. So we thin a piece of plastic and it will bend reproducibly. And then by putting a load of different bits of plastic, uh, little flexures across sort of a big monolithic stage, we can actually build up very, very fine, precise motion. And so then, of course, we do need some optics. So we've got a camera sensor. You can build a low cost version by taking a lens off a camera, off say a webcam, turning it around, print, putting it a distance away from the sensor and you get sort of quite a good microscope, not good enough for medical use, or you can actually take a good microscope objective. We actually buy them for about uh, $50 on AliExpress, get a, another lens just underneath it and a sensor, and then you can actually build a very good quality microscope. And so here we have an image that we've taken of red blood cells. So these, um, uh, this is for malaria diagnosis. So if you want to diagnose malaria, the gold standard is you look for parasites in blood. And so this is actually a stitched together image of multiple, multiple uh, eight megapixel images. And so normally a technician would manually move around and look for parasites in the blood. The microscope's automated. It can move around. You can then zoom in on different areas of this composite image and look for parasites. And so people often ask, like, how much does it really cost to produce a microscope? Do you need to go through all of this? And so a microscope, it might be 30 grand. If you need one in every clinic, that gets expensive, but not as expensive as when you actually start thinking about you want to keep these things running for a long time. So what's the parts cost to keep them running? But most importantly is the engineer travel. So we're talking about malaria diagnosis. We're interested in sub-Saharan Africa. There are often no engineers, company engineers uh, for these microscope companies in the country or sometimes even the continent. So you actually end up paying international travel every time you want to fix a single thing. And so that adds up quickly and it adds up to be more than the initial cost of the uh, microscope itself. So the Open Flexion project has been built around the ethos of if it can be built locally, it can be repaired locally. So we've produced a lot which in uh, Tanzania, which are being used for um, you're being used for trials in Ifakara Health Institute. This is actually a photo in Nairobi of uh, the microscope being produced for educational use. And so now we come to medical manufacturing. So it works. 
we can build it, how much more is actually needed? And it turns out there's a huge amount to go from something that works, something you can build, to something that you can actually certify as a medical device. And so when I say certify as a medical device, we have to look into the regulatory requirements. So the regulatory requirements for medical devices talk a lot about quality management systems. And the quality management system, it covers the design. Why was it built that way? You know, what decisions did you make? Why did you do this? And that all has to be recorded so you can actually show you've got a quality process. And then it also covers things like procurement. Why did you trust that supplier? Are you going to get the same part every time? Production. How can you ensure it's built properly? Not just this time, the one you test, but every single one you're going to produce. And also the long-term support. You're going to have... Um, you're going to have something out in the real world. People are going to need feedback. They're going to need support. They're going to have complaints. And there's a process you have to do to deal with that. So for us, we're mostly thinking about how we do the quality management system of a design for something that's open source, that's community based. But also, I think that if you're thinking about an open source design for something and you want it to be produced in lots of places, you can't do all of this for people they're going to have different procurement in different countries that's why it works you different people are going to have slightly different production facilities they're going to want to build it different ways if they build it different ways there's a slight design change but you need to collect all of this information together if you're going to help a manufacturer go through and actually produce something and so i, I apologize for lots of slides that uh pretty much don't have any pictures on it's because uh it's all based on the medical device standards, which unfortunately don't have many pictures. But um, so ISO 13485 is, is the big one for the medical quality management. And so it requires a project to have a quality manual. The quality manual, um, they say you take the open, you, the, you take the standard, you chop out the certain sections, you paste them into a document, and then you modify them for your particular organization so that they fit what you do. Now, this would be fine if the standard was open, and so Chris talked about this in an earlier talk, but it puts you in a very interesting position if you want to make your quality manual open, because you can't make your quality manual open unless you write it from scratch, and then how do you make sure it nicely uh, relates to ISO 13485? So it comes back to this issue of open standards. But then also to meet um, ISO 13485, you need to have documented design procedures. Uh, we go through and we do review meetings every so often, but you need to have minutes of these meetings. You need to have planning. You need to have specifications. And so these are things that we all do. We, we, we don't just sort of walk into a lab and start, I don't know, printing something. You, when you get your CAD out, you, you, you make a plan, but you don't necessarily record it in a way that somebody else can understand it. And that's the important point of ISO 13485 mostly is making you write down all of the things that you half thought about that were really important or you did think about fully, which were really important, but that record gets lost when you just sort of carry on. And um, a big part of it is control of the design and development changes. So this is something that projects that design in the open can do very well. A lot of them are on GitHub or GitLab. And so you've got a copy of the design over time. And importantly, you've all of the changes, you've hopefully discussed them in the open. So you've got more than just the design over time. You've got why it happened. So um, a key part of this is the the manufacturer is ultimately responsible for any medical device that goes on the market. So if you say, I want to do distributed manufacturing of a medical device, any manufacturer that's putting that out there has to be sure that the device does what it's meant to. So there's the quality management that goes into them making sure they produce the design as it's meant to, but there's also the level that go, there's also they have to be sure that the design does what it's meant to. And so a regulator can ask them questions about why it does certain things. And so there's there's all of this design thinking. So if you, uh, if you create a medical device, it can be the most fantastic and perfect device in the world. But if you only share the final design, it's useless for production unless the company is willing to say that you are ISO 13485 accredited and they are willing to trust you and take all of that responsibility, which is very unlikely. They can't 
sign a legal contract to offload that responsibility onto you. They have to take responsibility. If they want to take responsibility, they'll want to see all of the documentation to show that you've followed all of these steps. You've got records for your meetings, you're audited, et cetera. And so this is, this is the difficult part. And so I think for an open medical device design, we really need to be thinking about how we get all of this information in the right places so people can trust us. So why is all this required? It sounds quite onerous, but I think the, the important point that happened that came up so many times in the pandemic is building an air pump is pretty easy. I mean, I could get a vacuum cleaner and turn it on and off. Uh, of course, most of the um, most of the open source ventilators that were made were much, much more sophisticated than that. But at the at the end of the day, you have to not only ensure that your ventilator is safe to go on a patient, but it's safe to stay on a patient for maybe weeks at a time and to then carefully take them off uh, as they return to normal breathing. And so there's all of this. Um, there's all of this risk that you're taking. And so the way that they mitigate risk for medical devices is they make sure you've documented every piece of thinking. So in your ventilator, you decided to put this valve here rather than here. Why? Why did you do that? You know, that should be recorded. So let's say if it ever goes wrong, they can go back and check that you did your due diligence on the design. So how would an open medical device design work? And I think one of the key issues here is to separate in our minds design, like the final design for manufacturing from the original prototyping. And so we start with prototyping. At some point, we start to formalize the design. And But we can help ourselves while we're doing the prototyping. If we design openly and we move all the conversation online, then everyone knows um, you know, the more the conversation's online, the more of, you know, how to best to say this, sorry. So if you're, you know, let's say I'm designing with someone and I share a lab with them. We have a conversation, it's not recorded, it's lost. If we do it online, there's a record of all the conversations. There's a record in say an online forum, there's a record within the version control and you need to document all of your decisions and mistakes. And so then when you turn into the actual final design process, you start to formalize the roles. I'm in charge of uh, making sure that when somebody makes a change to the structure, it gets reviewed. And so you formalize those roles, you formalize how you do the reviews, you formalize making sure there are discussions at certain periods to periodically review things, to periodically check things, you make sure those discussions are minuted, and then you need to formalize all of the documentation and planning. So most of making the medical design is just formalizing your process and making sure it's very clear who is in charge of which part. So how do we actually do this in practice? I think we can learn a lot from the software industry. So for instance, DevOps platforms like GitLab, they've got the version controlled. You can actually set roles, you can set reviews. And so when somebody wants to make a merge request, you can review different parts of it. You've got automa automation for automated testing. We're building our own uh, uh, program called uh, Git Building for automated hardware documentation that does your bills of materials, et cetera. And then, uh, another big part of it is sort of the transparent governance and open communication. So, I mean, just starting by having a forum just gets all of these uh, conversations recorded for posterity and you get all of this extra knowledge in. But platforms need to guide teams through how they actually quality manage their design rather than everybody having to wade through the international standards, um, which are one, closed and two, incredibly hard to understand, even if you do get a consultant helping you. And so in the case of the microscope, we've got, um, I drew out this little roadmap of, we've got locally built working prototypes. At the university, we need to do failure mode analysis, final line to design for manufacture. Our partners in Tanzania, who will be the first producers, uh, Bongo Tech and Research, they need to actually start making their quality management system, making sure it's uh, up to ISO 13485 for all their production and procurement. But then part of that will be getting training and accredited from the Tanzania Bureau of Standards and Tanzanian Medical Devices Authority. But it's actually the first in vitro diagnostic device to be made in Tanzania. So this is a learning process, not only for Bongo Tech and Research, but also for the standards agencies in uh, Tanzania. And then as part of that, 
We work with Ifakara Health Institute for gathering cl clinical evidence. So yes, we've had it working. We've had it working for years and we've uh, taken lots of data. It works well, but the actual final step to uh, get it into get it into a hospital is probably at least as much work again. And so I think my quick summary is that designing a prototype really is only the first start for uh, something like a medical device. And we all really need to work together on how we work together. Um, and I'd just quickly like to acknowledge that there's a huge team behind the Open Flexure project. We've never all met in person together, so I had to uh, uh, use GIMP to try and sort of uh, add everybody into this composite photo. And I'd also like to thank our growing community of uh, people that are helping out with the project.